So, um, so these are the ingredients, the ingredients of, of, of language, which I am stealing from a class from Luigi. Um, and, um, you know, if you have to tell your boyfriend or girlfriend what is uh, uh, that you are studying, you are likely to come up with a description along these lines. No? So language is a system of basic symbols, and they consist of some atomic units, like words or morphemes, um, which are in turn articulated in a sequence of sounds or a sequence of gestures in the languages of the deaf, and um, a way of composing these units together um, which involves order decisions, right? So in English you say the mother, but say in Romanian you say mother the, and so on. And then a mapping into concepts, uh, which in turn then are related to reality. Um, and so sequences of words come to code thoughts and aspects of the world. No? This is a pretty basic and classical uh, view of how language works. Um, thus, in particular, essentially, language is viewed as a labeling device. And say the nouns are associated roughly in this fashion. Uh, you know, John will be associated with your mental image or concept of John, which in turn will point to the actual person, and bill to bill, table will be associated with things like this, and things like run will be associated with little mental movies of people running, and slapping will be associated with a particular action, and so on and so forth. And it is in virtue of this association between the words or morpheme and the concepts that then uh, you can use arrays of symbol to code things about reality. And so, for instance, uh, uh, something like John slaps Bill in English. In that, in that order, will, you know, each word will map onto its concept, and then the array of words will code that, for instance, John is the agent of the slapping, and Bill is the patient of the slapping. And then if you passivize this, so you do something to the verb, then the patient becomes the subject, and the agent becomes the biphrase. And this is, by and large, how language works. And, you know, there is a lot which is true about this image, about this broad picture of how language, words, comes to encode meaning. But there is also something essential that is missing. Um, so, what about these little words, like the biphrase? What does that convey? What about this tense morphing ED or the copula? What are they associated with? What is their role in this picture? Um, and this is, you know, this is a general issue of function words as opposed to content words. Right? So, content words are easy to map into things like concepts, mental images, and the like. But what do functions work do? And there are lots of those. If, or, because, when, even, some, only, and so on. And if you think about them, then this picture changes in a 
quite significant way. Uh, so there are indeed content words which might be inherently referential. Uh, but there are also function words which instead are inherently logical. They do not label anything. They are associated with inference patterns. And so one goes from this view of grammar as constituted by a lexicon that is essentially a labeling device plus a syntax, which is a combinatorial device, a structure building device, plus a store of concepts, which is essentially a mapping device from the words into the concept, this view into this view, where grammar is also rooted in a logic. And the access is the function words, and perhaps grammar is the main voice of, of logic, which might be the trait that characterizes homo sapiens like nothing else, like no other trait. And so this is in a way what I want to vent a little bit about today, um, that the little words, the function force, are really the main ingredient of constructing sense, of the construction, the spontaneous construction of sense that characterizes humans. Okay. And what is logic? What is it? This capacity to reason. Well, it's the little voice that tells you that certain things follow from other things and not vice versa. So, for example, suppose that you know that if John eats anything, he immediately gains weight. Thereby, you know that, for instance, if he eats pizza, he immediately gains weight. So the second sentence follows from the first, inexorably. And it's not true the other way around. So if John eats pizza, he immediately gains weight, does not entail that if it's anything, he immediately gains weight. Okay? And you know that this is so. And so here, in this context, the inference goes from a superset, eating anything, to a more specific set, eating pizza. Notice that here is the opposite. So if John is stressed out, he eats. This does not entail that if John is stressed out, it's pizza. It does not follow. But on the other hand, if you know that if John is stressed out, he eats pizza, you thereby know that if stressed out, he eats. Okay. So see, in this case, the inference goes from the specific set, the small set, to the large one. Okay. Well, this is logic. Logic is the little voice that tells you what follows from what. And this is something about the way if works in particular. You know, this inference pattern characterizes conditions. And the other thing that logic tells you is when something doesn't quite work or something is contradictory. So when John is nervous, he smokes, but he doesn't smoke anything illegal. It's a fine sentence. Can be true, can be false. When John is nervous, he smokes, but he doesn't smoke anything. Now that's a contradiction. And again, 
There is a little noise that immediately tells you, no, it doesn't, doesn't work, it doesn't compute. So we are endowed a speaker, and you know, this is completely regardless of the level of culture. So this has nothing to do with prescription. Any language has conditional, any language has negation, and they work in this way. Um, some inferences are more surprising than others and more strange. I like this one. These are things that you can use to kind of impress your friends. So imagine overhearing this dialogue. How was the test? Well, even Mary couldn't do it. Do you think that Mary is smart or dumb? Smart, right? Well, who told you that? How do you get to this conclusion? Now, change this. How was the test? Well, even John could do it. Dumb, right? Dumb, not very smart. Well, who told you that? How does this certainty grow in you? Who is the culprit? Which word is primarily responsible for this inference, you think? Even, right? Yeah, even. So, even seems to be associated with this wow, right? It's a mirative. Um, so if I say, even I am getting bored, I'm telling you that I'm getting bored, but I'm also saying, wow, right? I am the least likely to get bored at myself. Well, I don't know. And so this is the reasoning. You see, this is the reasoning that in no time you go through in your mind. John, not being able to do the test, is presented as unlikely. Usually, dumb people don't do great in tests. If John was dumb, it would be very likely for him not to do well. Therefore, he must not be dumb, he must be smart. So in a fraction of a time, you go through this reasoning. And again, this is not the kind of things that you're taught in school. It's you simply a capacity that you develop. And similarly, mutatis mutandis, you see this is interact with negation again in no time. So this mechanism is extremely powerful, extremely, extremely powerful. Now, this is a thread. This is something that has changed in my lifetime. Right? And I started out firmly believing in the initial picture that I've given you, where essentially language is a labeling device and you use arrays of symbols to code the way in which things are arranged in reality, and that was it. Um, and then, this is what, what has kind of changed, that logic seems to play an extremely direct role in determining certain grammaticality patterns. And so the view that on the one hand, there is the combinatorial system that tells you what is well-formed and what isn't well-formed. And then there is the decoding of this. That in fact, in determining what is well-formed and what is not, inference, grammar, logic enters directly. 
And in fact, certain sentences are ungrammatical, not because there is something wrong with their syntax, uh, but because they have a certain logical status and they are either logically true or logically false and hence informationally trivial. And this marks them as not belonging to the language. Um, now, this immediately raises a, a problem, a demarcation problem, because there are certainly plenty of sentences that are logically determinate in this sense, informationally trivial, that are totally well formed and that we use all the time. So if I tell you, you know, on this issue, you either are with me or you are not. This is a tautology, but it's a perfectly grammatical. And in fact, one that tells you something about, you know, we can use it to convey things. And so I want to point at certain kind of sentences that are informationally trivial and are ungrammatical. And then I want to discuss why they have this special status, why they are different from ordinary tautologies. So this is the plan. This is how I will abuse all your patience today. Uh, I we'll discuss how logic determines certain grammaticality patterns. Um, I want to address this demarcation problem of what makes certain logically determined sentences ungrammatical and address certain issue, um, certain answers to this question uh, that were explored in the last 20 years by decree increasingly young, smart, bright young people. And so, you know, originally this guy, then this guy, all the way up to your own Salvatore. And see where this leaves us with respect to the relation between grammar and logic. So this is again a very easy way an easy example that you can play readily, okay? So suppose that we are wondering, you have to do some grading and you're wondering how many assignments will you have graded uh, by dinner time? We want to go to the movies. Uh, so you could answer, you know, maybe even 50 if you let me work. Or you could answer, Maybe not even one, if you hang around like that. But you could not answer, you know, maybe even one. That's weird. Sounds like a lame joke. Uh, why? Again, a very quick thought. You know what you're doing? You are computing a theorem of probability theory. That's what you're doing. Um, so remember, even, so even P presupposes that P is wowing. It's the least likely thing to be true in the context that you're in. Okay. Um, so it asserts P and it presupposes that P is unlike. Okay. But now sentences are ordered by entailments as we know. And so if you have graded 50 assignments, well, you have graded also 40, right? and also 30, and so on. 
So the inference, the entailment goes from the high numbers to the low number. Okay. So this means that grading 50 is among, you know, at the strong end of the scale. It entails a lot of alternatives. Negation flips entailment patterns. No? Negation is a, an inverter of entailment patterns. And so it flips the entailment relation. If you didn't grade one, you didn't grade two, you didn't grade three, and so on. So when you negate something, when you when you are here, maybe even 50, you're saying something strong and therefore unlikely. When you put negation and you say not even one, not one, again, you're saying something strong because negation flips. Right? But if you associate even with a positive one, then you're associating even with something which is really weak is entailed by all of its alternatives. And you cannot be less likely than something that entails you. And this is the theorem of probability theory that you are spontaneously attuned to. And if this is not the reason why this sounds bad, then what is? So, this is pretty, right? and it's quite remarkable. So, C is deviant because it is contradictory. It's saying, I am very slightly, but you can't be because there are alternatives that entail you. Now, you've heard about gramma grammaticalization. Well, this paradigm, so in Italian, for instance, the same thing worked with um, words like addirittura. How many assignments will you have graded? Well, addirittura cinquanta. But it's weird to say, well, addirittura un. Anche, the additive, so additive and mutatives are continuous. In fact, even has also an additive component. And anche works also in this way. Right? Uh, but anche cinquanta, or neanche uno, but not, oh, anche uno. Again, sounds like a joke, an attempt at a joke. Uh, this fact is very pervasive, and in fact, it is one of the ways in which the languages of the world systematically manufactures negative polarity items. Negative polarity items are things like neanche that want a negative, want to be in a negative environment, and you know, so like any in English, for example. Uh, again, a very impressive distribution, right? John believes that there are any cookies left. It's severely deviant. It feels like an agreement violation. Okay. But John doubts that there are any cookies left. It's perfect. You switch from a positive verb to a negative verb, and the same string of sentences, the words become perfect. If you're getting hungry, there are any cookies left. Senseless, unprocessably senseless. If there are any cookies left, you won't get hungry. Look at this, right? There are any cookies left, same string of words. In the consequent of a conditional word salad, in the antecedent of a conditional perfect. And Paraphrase it with even one. And you see that it exactly pans out and makes sense. Right? So, 
if you are getting hungry, there is even one cookie left. If there is even one cookie left, you won't get hungry. Perfect. Okay. So much so that you are tempted to imagine that any is essentially the same as even one. In fact, any etymologically comes from one. It's the same root as German einige, ein. Right? So it's a, the word for one plus an adjectival ending. It means one like. Um, but, you know, whether this is so or not, as I said, every language, every second language, manufactures NPIs in this fashion, by right? taking a word that is negative in nature or additive and sticking on top of it an expression of small amount, like one or some. So very explicitly, for instance, in Hindi, uh, you have this, which means one, this, which means even or also, and you cannot really say in this order, uh, even when man came, you have to say, even when man didn't come. And it goes on and on, language after language. As I said, one out of two, roughly, including in our own backyard, words like neanke. Um, so, this is a strongly, you see, you see what the discovery is? The discovery is that the reason why this feels so bad, so out of the language, the reason why there are any cookies left, is so profoundly ungrammatical. It's not because there is something weird with its syntax, but these are contradictions. Now, of course, the syntax drives it, right? You, you, you do need to associate in some strict way, even one. The difference why even one doesn't sound like that in Italian is because the association is not obligatory. Right? It can associate, even can associate with one, but it doesn't have to. But in, in these languages, you force the association. And then you manufacture something that is going to make sense only in negative, downward entailing environments. Do you see the logic of it? Because if you lose this point, then nothing will make sense. And you see why this is strange from a traditional perspective? Right? Because you're tempted to say that the combinatorial apparatus lets you have. So this is, this is not like, Green ideas sleep furiously. It's not like that. That is grammatical, you know. You can write poems. Maybe it cannot be true in the real world, but it's fine. Here, you're dealing with something that feels like, uh, you know, you by a squalor feels like an agreement violation. But yet, the reason why that comes about is because that array is forced to be contradictory. 
And so this is kind of game changing, if, if, if true. And this has been always like that. Since semantics came, up, came about, we kept running into the desire to explain things in this way. Since we figured out how to put together syntax and semantics in a reasonable way, and the traditional picture that I developed in the beginning was instrumental in reaching this stage, immediately then we wanted to explain things in terms of contradictory, contradictoriness and non-contradictoriness. Um, and it was hard to do because certain contradiction or certain tautologies look perfectly grammatic. And so, you know, what is wrong with this, with even one? What is special about even one? And let me give you some examples. You don't have to believe me, okay? But, the, the, you know, the, the paradigm of things that seem to be working in this way is broad. Uh, so exception phrases, for instance. Uh, so you can say, everyone but Adriana likes me. Or no one but Adriana likes me. But you cannot say someone but Adriana likes me. It's not because you cannot conceive of a plausible sense to attach to it. Not that sentence could mean someone who is not Adriana likes me. But it doesn't mean that. It cannot mean that. So exception phrases work with no one, work with everyone, but don't work with someone. So here is an idea. Imagine that this kind of exception phrases mean the sentence without the exception phrase is false. But if you take out of the domain the exception, they become true. So everyone but Adriana likes me say it's false that everyone likes me is true. It's not the case that everyone likes me. But if you take Adriana out of the domain, then it becomes true. Similarly, no one but Adriana likes me, same way. No one likes me is false. But if you take Adriana away, it becomes true. Okay. Now apply this to some. So someone likes me is false. But if you take it the other way, it becomes true. Contradictory. Cannot be. So that's a contradiction. And again, you see, A, the simplicity of the explanation, which convinces you that it must be so. And then you say, wow, I'm computing a logical contradiction, and it's having this impact. And this applies to, to many constructions, to many constructions. And in fact, it is important to remark that the same is true of presuppositions. See, semantics is about these three fundamental families of relations. It's about entailments, it's about presuppositions, and it's about implicatures. So semantics is inherently relational. That's the difference with syntax, right? Syntax is a building of a structure. Semantics is about the relation between structures. How does the information content associated with the structure relate to the information content associated with this? And then you classify them in entailment, presuppositions, or implicatures, depending on some of their characteristics. Presuppositions are not at issue and are preserved under entailment cancelling operations like negation. Okay, so that's the hallmark of presupposition. 
So that's the difference between John walked, John walked out and it was John. These two sentences have the same content, if anything does. Their presuppositions are different. John walked out presupposes nothing in particular, but it was John walked out. It's only felicitous if you are willing to take it for granted that someone did. And the negation test is a telltale. It wasn't John who walked out, still presupposes that someone did. So, so presupposition persists across entailment cancelling operations like negation. Now, while people are very, very unwilling to accept contradictions as a source of ungrammaticality, they are happy about accepting presuppositions, failures, as a source of ungrammaticality. And so, for example, uh, in the literature, it has been argued that these are cases of um, presupposition failures. So, for example, um, John was born for an hour. You cannot say it. This is a very persistent fact. Being born is still weak and doesn't go with four an hours. Even if it took an hour for John to be born, you cannot say that John was born for an hour. Okay. Presupposition failure. For an hour, looks for something atelic. It applies to atelic eventualities. But being born is etilic, so presupposition clash. You're trying to apply a function to something which is not in its domain. Um, similarly, for things like this, this is a typical mass count violations. You can say, I inherited a lot of furniture from my aunt or I inherited three pieces of furniture from my aunt. But you cannot say I inherited three furnitures from my aunt. Hmm? Similarly in Italian. I went to the market e ho comprato tre mobili. Tre mobili. Okay. Um, so again, there is something about the mass count distinction that makes mass noun uncountable. Impossible to, and you know, it's not something about the real world necessarily, given that what's the difference between mobile and mobile? So it's something about the internal structure or whatever. Again, presupposition failure. And people are happy with it. But here too, you find exactly the same demarcation problem. Because there are zillions of presupposition failures that are not grammatical like that. So if I say, for instance, now, the Italian in this room is puzzled. That's a presupposition failure. You won't be able to understand what I'm saying. Who am I talking about? Which Italian? There is more than one Italian. Okay. So presupposition failure, but perfectly grammatical. There is no question that the sentence, the Italian in this room is puzzled, is perfect Italian. So you get a presupposition failure that is perfectly grammatical, but then you get these presupposition failures that are catastrophically ungrammatical. And so what is going on? Why certain presuppositions failures are ungrammatical and others are grammatical? You see the parallelism with the problem of contradictions. 
certain contradictions or certain trivialities are anglomatical and others are not. And so what is going on? So, well, it's time to get a little bit more specific <laughs> and try to understand the source of all this. Now, one of the most forceful ways in which logical determinacy can be thought of is in terms of, you can think of it as like topic invariance or domain invariance. So something is logically determined if it either is true no matter what, or false no matter what. And so it doesn't care what are the domain of objects that you're talking about. This is the intuition. And this can be made very precise. There are notions like permutation invariance. Okay. Um, but I don't want to get too technical. Um, but this is the form that the problem takes. Why are certain presupposition, certain domain insensitive sentences ungrammatical and others perfectly grammatical? So these guys are perfectly grammatical. How's the weather? Well, it rains and it doesn't. It has the shape of a contradiction, but you can easily make sense of it. Maybe it's raining on and off. Um, is John up to task? Well, he is and he isn't. Again, completely natural. Um, so, there is a corollary to this. See, you immediately see that these sentences have a special status. You immediately perceive them as literally contradictory. But instead, the sentences that I've brought up, the exception phrases of the example of the negative polarity items, I had to sweat to stand a chance at convincing you that there was something about the logic of those sentences that was wrong. I had to come up with an analysis. And the analysis is and remains controversial. So if I'm right, it means that those contradictions associated with things like negative polarity items or exception phrases or their sentences, those are subconscious. They don't easily come to your conscious as such. This no. And let's bear this in mind. So where we stand, is that not all syntactically well-formed sentences are grammatical and logic enters in the definition of grammaticality. So here grammaticality is a, like a pre-theoretical notion. It's a sort of a-theoretical notion, things that are felt not to be in the language. Still, things that are kind of unrescuably or almost unrescuably there. So here is the, uh, an, an early idea. Oh, this debate is long. So, because we care, but imagine logicians, right? They, they do want to know what they're talking about. So they do want to know what is the source of a logical truth? What is a logical truth rooted in? Right? And this debate on the nature of logical truth is as old as Aristotle. And it really goes through the whole history of thought. And the answer is not easy. And it's not much deeper than the one that I've given you. There is a fundamental distinction between function words and content words. Uh, and logic is what stands from the nature of function words. 
Um, and this is a particular implementation of it, which is rather elegant in the way in which it roots, into, it, roots it into grammar. So if you imagine, let's compare, you know, this is a toy example, but hey, what the hell? Um, so this is a canonical contradiction. He is smart and he is not. And you see, I've drawn a rough picture of its syntactic structure, and I have assumed that he is and he isn't is just ellipses. Is John Smart, he is and he isn't ellipses. So you compute this full structure, you don't pronounce the adjective. Okay? And this is the rough structure of an NPI violation. There are any cookies left. Okay. Now you see, any uh, linguist will immediately draw this difference between the function component of the syntactic tree and the content component. They're even called the lexical categories and the functional categories, the functional layers and the lexical layer. And here is then the generalization. This will come out as contradictory only if you insert here the same content words. But this will come out as contradictory no matter what you insert here. And you can compute that a priori. This is a very beautiful insight. Okay. It's a very beautiful insight. Given the meaning of any as even one, then even one A, B always contradictory, no matter what you put in A and what you put in B. But John is A and is not A, will only work if you pick the same words for A and not A. Okay. So, you see, both grammar and logic are sensitive primarily to functional structure, but in a way grammar is even more sensitive because logic cares as to whether two content things are the same or not. And grammar doesn't even care about that. So, and all of a sudden, this clicks. And you say, oh, wow, yeah. So the things that are truly, the logical contradictions or tautologies that are truly ungrammatical are those that they can compute without even looking at the content lexicon. just by looking at the grammatical structure alone. Logical contradictions, I also don't look very deeply into the lexicon, but I care whether they are the same or not, whether two instances are the same or not. And there is something very sound about this insight. Yeah, so I just said that. And now I'm going to consider an amendment to this, uh, an amendment by this young man, Guillermo del Pinal, from Guatemala. Um, instead of thinking in terms of replacing things in a synthetic tree, think in terms of fooling around with the meaning of content words. What does that mean? Imagine inserting something that changes the meaning of content words. Uh, so that, for example, when you say John is smart and he's not smart, 
you interpret smart in slightly different way. The first occurrence might be street smart. And the second one could mean a good problem solver. So you, in, you, you allow yourself a plausible reinterpretation of the content words, which can be modeled by the insertion of certain meaning changing function on the content words. And so that the logical forms wind up looking like this. So there is any cookies, any cookie left is even one. So it's even the case that there is one cookie left. And these are the modulating functions, the functions that can change the meaning of words. And similarly for it trains and it doesn't train, you see? Now, what happens is that this comes out as contradictory. No, you know, even if you stick these modulating functions, it doesn't matter. It will still be contradictory. You can change the meaning as much as you like, but you will still get a contradiction. But here, here you will not, right? If you interpret, for instance, this rain as it's raining a little, and this raining as is raining a lot, then you get a non contradiction. It's raining a little and it's not raining a lot. Right? You get rid of the contradiction through this reinterpretation process. But here, you can reinterpret till you are blue in your face, it will still be contradictory. So you see that this is a very similar intuition, but except instead of thinking as some kind of replacement of forms, you think of as a context, contextualization of meaning or the meaning of content words. Okay. And so this is sort of nice and, you know, it makes life easier um, when you have alternatives around. Like, you know, even I should explain maybe this notation. Even says, this is true and is the least likely among its alternatives. Right? So it presupposes that this is the least likely among these alternatives and the alternatives are the other numbers. So even one, even two, even three. Right? One, two, three. And you're saying, I'm choosing this as the least likely. Okay? So this is a cl classical alternative sentence, alternative sentences, alternative sentences, no, alternative sensitive sentence. And this is how this is very often notated. Okay. Now, th this is starting to, uh, it begins to look a little bit awful, okay? I cannot, you know, you have to ask if you don't understand. Um, so, I'm, I'm getting serious, right? So I want to make sure that I'm not cheating, right? And I, got, I want to give you a chance to catch me out if I'm cheating. So I, I want to lay out the definitions explicitly. And I want to define a notion of grammatical triviality as opposed to a notion of logical determinacy. Right? And I want to say that certain logically determined sentences are grammatically trivial. Okay. So um, we have logical forms, meanings that are, look like this. Let me explain it informally without going through the formal definition. Um, and so I call this a modulated logical form and the modulation is at these points, right? At the points of the content words. Okay. Now, 
something is grammatically trivial, if it's true or false, no matter how you interpret these variables. So simply, for any assignment, no matter how you pick these variables, you're going to get either something that is true in any domain or something that is false in any domain. This instead is not going to come out as grammatically trivial in this sense, no? because if you choose your functions right, you are not going to get a contradiction. And so this is going to come out as a contradiction only for uniform choices of the values for this two functions. By uniform, I mean that if, if they are applied to the same constant, they have to deliver the same value. Got it? So, in this case, this is, these are two constants, right? Two lexical items, content words. And these functions are applying to the same constant, then they have to return the same value. You, you are free to modulate it, you can map raining into snowing, but you have to map both occurrences of rain into snowing. Got it? And I'm going to call this uniform modulations. So you are logically true or logically false if you come out as true on any uniform modulation. Okay? It's a simple idea. Uh, you, know, the, you have to be a little bit precise, but very simple, conceptual. And this is what this says. And so, this sentence will come out as logically determined no matter how, which modulation you pick, and hence it's going to be grammatically true. But this sentence is only going to come out as contradictory for uniform modulations, and hence it's going to be logically true or logically false, but not grammatically true. That's what you, that's what you want. This is the example. I just went through it. Um, so basically, this is a simple way to capture the idea. And it has this advantage of grounding this into something that is, makes functional sense. So you are going to be grammatically deviant if you are contradictory no matter what. So you have to change the meaning of the logical world to get out of the contradiction, which you cannot do. But you are simply logically trivial if you only need to change the meaning of the content. Okay? So it preserves the original Gajewski's insight, but it improves on it. Um, yeah. So this distinction is uh, okay. What are function words? Speak up. Do speak up. What are function words? What are content words? Yeah. And it's obviously, you know, there is a danger of circularity. Um, and it's not easy to pin down. But Anyone who has even the faintest acquaintance with any grammatical notion knows that you cannot live without it. In any language, you're going to very quickly zero into the, this, this distinction. You're in, immediately going to sort of divide it up right, into content items and morphemes small words, particles, and they are going to determine the syntactic skeleton. So, it doesn't matter how problematic it is, it exists. And it cannot be by chance that all the logicians' logical words, the every, the some, the and, the or, are always coded 
as grammatically functioning. Cannot be random that this is so. Also, of course, the sense of the linguist sense of functional is broader than the logicians. Problem, again, you know, smart people come up with problems, and here is one. Um, so John is never himself. Contradictory, if anything is, but perfectly grammatical. Does our notion capture this? Uh, it's not obvious, right? Because, you know, the, the logical form of John is never himself will be something like it's never the case that this, which is a property of being identical to itself, is true of John. And you see, this is the logical stuff, right? So in, in himself is, is, is a bound variable, right? And variables are, are logical things, if anything is. And so I'm not supposed to be sensitive to that, right? I can, I can only modulate John. I can change the meaning of John. That's a content word. But I cannot fool around with the meaning of himself, because that's logical stuff. So there is a, a problem here. And it's not just limited to identity statement. Now, today, John is more eloquent than himself. Same thing. Um, and so this should be ungrammatical, right? Because by playing with modulation, I cannot see why this sentence makes sense. Because I can only modulate John, I cannot modulate anything else by inserting, by changing, you know, I cannot fool with the meaning of himself. Um, and so, uh, I think that, you know, the only way out is that you must be able to modulate variables. So you must be able to change the meaning of variables so that you can interpret something like John today is not the person that he usually is. So he doesn't have the properties that he usually has. Something like that. Right? So you have to be able to insert a modulating function on the variable. And this modulation has to be intentional, has to pick a concept, not just pick an entity. So this looks like a little irregularity in the system, right? We had a pretty beautiful system and this is a little bit of a little wrench. Not catastrophic, but, but a snag of sorts. Um, on the other hand, these things are known to occur. Right? And so in particular, one area from which this is familiar is the direct to delay distinction where you can have what looks like contradictory beliefs about the same person. Uh, I resorted to Oedipus, but you know, more homely, right? You might have met me in the past and forgotten about me. And when you met me, you might have formed the idea, oh, he's a nice guy. He's a fun guy. And you meet me again, and you say, ha, oh, he's a boring guy. Same person. So you believe of me under the person that you met five years ago that I was fun. 
and you believe of me as a person that you meet now, that I will bore you like hell. Right? And these things happen, and are known to happen, and people have developed strategies for dealing with them. And these strategies do involve inserting these sort of guises or concepts on referential terms. Uh, and so the picture changes in the following way. You can allow to modulate, to play around with non-logical constants, i.e. canonical content words, but also variables. And they are the referential points of a structure. Like you have a structure and then there are points that point outwards. Those are the things that you can modulate. That's the generalization really. So it's not too bad. It's still coherent. And then there are lots of, all, all of a sudden you start getting into, into business, so to speak. Uh, so, for example, our own guru, Noam Chomsky, has been developing arguments that there is something wrong with reference that are based on things like this. So, that, this is actually literally true. I, let me first give you the example, then I'll tell you the story. But, um, so, something like London is big and polluted. Okay, London refers to the city of London. Right? But when you say London is big, do you mean, you mean something like the surface it occupies is big? Polluted. You don't mean that the surface is polluted, maybe also, but it's the air around it that is polluted. So London has to be something that has a surface, but it also encompasses the air around it. And so it started developing this idea that the notion of reference is problematic. And it's true, it's, it's quite hard to say what London is exactly, right? And you get into all these problems, right? If you London and you wipe it out and you rebuild it one meter eastward, is it the same city or is it not, the, you know, But you can kind of bypass this line of argument so that, you know, there are a couple of reactions to this. One is feast on the table and say, no, things refer. And the other is, okay, you are right. What matters is the logic of it. And so let's assume that we can modulate London differently on different occurrences. That is to say, we can attach different concepts to it on different occurrences. And then we can still reason on this basis quite well, and at the same time considering that, yeah, the notion of reference has its problem and we have to find some ways around it. It's ultimately perhaps pragmatically grounded and so on. This is another classical example. No? This book has 200 pages and it's scary. 200 pages is a physical volume that has. Scary is not the physical volume. The physical volume is never going to scare anybody. It's a content. So it's book as a material object and the book as a story. And these shifts are very common and widespread. And some are, here, but nonetheless systematic, right? 
So if you see the London office called, offices don't call, like people in the offices call. So that's a, na a natural metonymy, a natural contiguity. This is more on the fly, right? You are waiting at a bar, and you say the ham sandwich wants its beer. And you mean the person who ordered the ham sandwich. So these are all cases that can be regarded as clustering around the same idea. And so this is more or less the picture. And I will conclude by something that is a chip on my shoulders. And this is something that won't interest the majority of you, but to us it was, well, no, I, I don't mean this in any derogatory way. It's just, a, you know, it stands a chance of feeling as a discussion on the sex of the angels, as they say. It's, but it's something that divides, divides us very much. So if you look at semantic textbooks, some of them use something that is called model theory. Right? They use model theoretic semantics. My textbook does. The recent textbook by uh, Champollion and Kopok does. They use translation into logical language and model theory. But other textbooks don't. And for instance, Larson and Siegel doesn't, Kratzer and Heim doesn't. They use absolute definition of truth. And we argue over this. We've argued over this all our lives. Okay? And it's funny, no? Because we could talk to each other and make progress and argue on substantive matters while having this deeply held different belief. And let me try to give you a little sense of what is this about. Uh, and thereby, I will be echoing some of the discussion that we had over the years. So, the difference is essentially in the interpretation of content words, right? So, if you look, for instance, at the way in which um, Heimann Kratzer would spell out the, or Russian and Siegel would spell out the uh, meaning of a lexical entry like run, they would say, okay, relative to a certain domain of discourse in a certain world and relative to a certain assignment, which won't play a role because there are no variables in there, um, this is going to be a function that in a certain world and for a given individual returns one, just if that individual runs in W. So this is a, your typical Davidsonian, Tarskian characterization of meaning, right? So here you are naming a word and here you're using it. So you're relying on your competence as speakers to understand how that function works. So this is anchoring a word to a, a real function, the running function. And, you know, it's going to be tricky to, to define, right? Running, you know how it is, what's the difference between running and walking, you know? Yes. The Olympics, think Olympics. If you run the march, you are disqualified. If you, if you are on the march, you are disqualified if you run. And what is running? How is it defined? Yes, both feet off the ground. If both feet, there is a moment where both feet are off the ground, you are done. Okay? Uh, so it's tricky. Right? And then how many steps do you need to take? Don't, don't ask. Um, at any rate, this anchors 
a word, a content word, into the world. And so it gives actual truth conditions, right? which may be hard to assess, but there is an anchoring. When you do model theory instead, you are slapped away from this. And perhaps this will come as no surprise at this point to you, right? Because as we said, logicians and linguists don't care that much about the content. They care about the function model. Um, and so, for, you know, this is what is called a model. A model is, you know, some domains, the universe of discourse, and an interpretation for the non-logical constant. So, in a way, modern theoretic semantics gives up from scratch on content words. Right? And it gives truth conditions that are relative to a specific choice of content. And so, with my friends and colleagues, we spent all our time going back and forth and saying, you are not capturing truth conditions. And I would reply, and you are not capturing entailment. How so? Well, there is a definition of entailment that you can give on most notions, and it involves quantifying over these things, right? So, in the relative approach, you quantify over models, i.e. you quantify over possible meanings of content words. But in this, you're quantifying over domains and worlds, and you're keeping constant the meaning of content words. Now, these two approaches yield pretty much the same results, except in these cases. So, well, suppose that this is, well, this is not water, but suppose it is. Okay. If there is water in here. No. I won't listen to Trump. Uh, if there is water in here, there has to be oxygen. This water is H2O. Right. Now, according to the absolute definition of truth, this is a, an entailment. Given the definition that I have given you here, right, water will be anchored to something that has to be H2O. It has to contain oxygen, if you like. And so if there is water, then there is oxygen. And this has the same status as John and Bill run, therefore John runs. It has exactly the same status according to this definition. Okay. Not on the model theoretic approach, right? Because on the model theoretic approach, you're, you are not anchored to a specific definition of water. You, have, you are constraining it, right? You may constrain it to it being mass, for example. But you're not anchoring it to a specific definition of water. Right? So it does not come out as an entailment. It can be a physical truth or whatever, but it's not an entailment. And frankly, I think that that's right. So, you know, I felt that I was right and they were wrong. And I still feel so. Right? Luckily, semantics could go on without having to decide on this. 
And uh, for instance, Kasser, when we were discussing this, all the, that's not my job. I think it, it is. Right? So I'm interested, you know, for me, entailment is something that must grow spontaneously into the child with very limited exposure. This is stuff about hidden essences. That's a whole different ballgame. And I want my theory to reflect that and distinguish it. So if I have to give up truth conditions or entailment, so if you force me to choose between getting truth conditions partly right, but entailment wrong, and vice versa, I would go for the vice versa. But now I went into all this because in some sense, the approach that I sketched enables us to all live happily as a big happy family ever after, right? Because um, now we have these logical forms that are like a skeleton in which you can insert these modulation points. And so you can give an absolute definition of truth if you so feel inclined, because then you are allowing yourself to modulating and you have this notion of uniform modulation that will preserve what you need to get entailment right. So this is a bit of a foundational thing that I felt like sneaking in. But the important take home, and you know, if you're going to go on and study lingu linguistics, bear this in mind because it's extremely fruitful. Is extremely, extremely fruitful. There are evident signs of logicality in grammar. And nobody today in his right mind can deny that. Now, there are signs of logicality outside of language. Right? There are sparse signs of logicality outside of language, right? Like the no navigation system of an ant will need Boolean functors. Will, will need how to deal with choices or with adding information or with conditions. Right. But it will be very sparse. And clearly, the supervenience of this powerful recursion on top of this probably pre-existing sort of precursors of logical elements is what did the trick for us. But besides this big picture thing, in our daily work, it will be very, very useful to be able to distinguish where things like locality, intervention, minimality, notions that have to do with the specific of the recursion matters, and where logic, contradiction matters. That will, you know, that seems to be progress. This is, this is you know, what I feel I've kind of learned, and it's just the beginning. Sene can be. And then I think, uh, yeah, uh, I've already said enough big words, and I will uh, conclude by reminding you that. We have a cool way of sifting the role of logic and grammar from its role in general deduction. And sentences that are 
logically determinate on any modulation, and by modulation I mean tinkering with the referential points, i.e. the content words of the variables, um, will be ungrammatical. And we kind of have a good angle on the demarcation problem that extends also to presuppositions. Presuppositions are just contradictions. Presupposition failure are contradiction, some certain assumptions. Um, and, you know, we are ready for a new family of questions. Like, how do the specific primitives that language uses emerge? That's really not trivial at all. And are there substantive constraints in modulation? And this is what Salvatore has to contemplate to us. And how are these subconscious inferences computed? So this is not a bad spot to be in. And um, I want to thank my friends and teachers.